would like to thank the 282nd Army Band of Fort Jackson, commanded by Chief Warrant Officer 3, Kevin L. Pick. All right, good afternoon, and thank you so much for joining us for this special Inauguration Day coverage. I'm Andrea Mock. And I'm Darcy Strickland. We are moments away from the start of the 98th South Carolina wow. inauguration as we wait for Governor Henry McMaster to begin what could be a historical new term. Absolutely. This is Governor McMaster's second time, actually third time, but second official ceremony being sworn in as our governor. He is seven. 75 years old, was born here in South Carolina. Now, of course, he has been our governor since 2017. That's when he took over, when Governor Nikki Haley at the time was appointed to be the ambassador of the United Nations. So he took over in 2017 and then won election again twice after that. We have live team coverage of Inauguration Day at the State House. We're going to begin. Our team coverage now with J.R. Berry, who is standing by with Dave Wilson from Insiders, one of our political experts, to talk more about what today means for all South Carolinians. Darcy, Andrea, good morning to the both of you. Dave, good morning to good you morning, as well. JR. The processional is getting ready to start right behind us right now. Uh, we're going to be seeing the General Assembly, the Court of Appeals, the Supreme Court, the entire congressional delegation. This is going to be about a 25 or 30 minute process. It does take a while to get that many members of the General Assembly and all of the other elected and constitutional officials of our state down those stairs. 
Uh, there are 170 members of our legislature, 124 members of the House, mm -hmm. uh, 46 members of the Senate, as well as those folks who are in the courts, as well as our constitutional officers are going to get sworn in today. Mm -hmm. So it's a big day in South Carolina. Part of that uh, uh, processional of the General Assembly will include the House Minority Leader, Todd Rutherford, who will be joining us here very soon during this broadcast. Big day for Governor McMaster, his uh, second full term getting ready to start here in the state. This is going to be a big moment for South Carolina history. We have to keep in mind that, that Henry McMaster walked into the governorship as lieutenant governor when Nikki Haley became ambassador to the U.N. That gave him two, almost two full years as governor of South Carolina. He won election as governor uh, four years ago. This is going to be his second full term, Jr., and that means if he stays the entire four years, he will be the longest serving governor in South Carolina history. And that is a big thing for a man who honestly has wanted nothing more than to be governor of his state. I've known uh, Governor McMaster since the 80s when he was running for Congress. And you're right, he has held a number of offices throughout the state of South Carolina over the years. I believe he's been uh, the chair of the Republican Party. He's he, was, been... he, he started as chairman of the Richland County Republican <laughs> yeah. Party, the state Republican Party. Uh, he has served as our attorney general right. for eight years, lieutenant governor, and now governor of South Carolina for going on his second full term. Also, he served as U.S. attorney under Ronald Reagan. Right. He was the first U.S. attorney that Ronald Reagan appointed uh, here in South Carolina. So that was Henry McMaster's life, his 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 dream has always been to be a leader for South Carolina, and I think you're going to see today, and you have seen in the way he's been interacting with the mm -hmm. legislature over the last year, last few years, how much he is in tune with what we need for our state. I believe House Minority Leader Todd Rutherford is uh, going to join us now. He just came down the steps as part of the processional. You Todd, ran fast, my friend. Good morning to you, Todd. <laughs> it's kind of a slow run. Talk about your thoughts on this day. Well, it's exciting uh, anytime we have an inauguration of a governor, even though he will be the longest serving governor governor in recent memory in South Carolina history. Um, but it's a beautiful day. It's a beautiful day for South Carolina to see, again, the transition of power, even though we're not giving it over to someone new, that the governor is being inaugurated, that the entire General Assembly comes down and people get to see their state government in action today. What are you hoping to see over the next four years as far as legislation is concerned and governing under uh, under Governor McMaster? I'm hoping to see a, a bipartisan approach as he has already done. I'm hoping to see South Carolina keep running on all cylinders as we have done. He did a great job during the pandemic of not shutting us down, and we are being rewarded for that every day with the revenues that we're seeing. And we're plowing that back, and back into South Carolina as quick as we can, making sure that economic development is on trend and going where it needs to, and plowing most of the money back into education. The bulk of our budget goes to education. You've heard the Senate majority majority leader say that. You've heard the Speaker of the House say that. And you hear me say that as well. We are laser focused on trying to get our educational standards up, stop the brain drain in South Carolina, because that is how you get more economic development. So we are making South Carolina move on all cylinders. Dave, uh, the governor's already presented his budget proposal for the upcoming fiscal year, which right. includes some money for the rainy day <clears throat> fund. To our viewers at home, what does that mean? Imagine this, half a billion dollars is going back into the savings account for the state of South Carolina. That's an important thing to keep in mind because we're going to see economic ups and downs, ups and downs, and we're in a phenomenal period of economic growth. I think there's been almost $10 billion of economic growth that has been announced in South Carolina this past year. That is jobs coming in, people getting paid, things that are being done, and so when you have that level of, of growth in our state, we see that level of importance for let's make sure that we can sustain that as the economy goes up and down and up and down, which can be a little fearful every now and then when you think about where things are going. going to happen. Everybody's anticipating a downturn. Hopefully it won't be that hard. So we're preparing for that, giving commerce the money they need right now rather than making them bond issues as they come up to make sure that, again, South Carolina just keeps moving. I want to go over to Becky Budge right now. She's also out here for today's event. Becky, what, what do you see from where you are? JR, it's a beautiful day here. And as you can see behind me, it's a full house here. And let me talk through some of the people in attendance. Right now we have the General Assembly walking down. That includes the majority Republican House and Senate here who have backed McMaster. We also have five former governors here. That includes Richard Riley, who served from 1979 to 1987. 
Beasley, which served from 1995 to 1999. We have Jim Hodges, Mark Sanford, and Nikki Haley all in attendance to support Henry McMaster today. We also have David Wilkins, the former SC House Speaker, and former U.S. Ambassador to Canada, Ed McMullen, who's the former U.S. Ambassador to Switzerland. I've heard that the Columbia Mayor, Dan Rickman is also in attendance. And you can see that the Senate is walking down right now. We have Senate Minority Leader Brad Hutto, Senate Majority Leader Shane Massey, and all other 46 senators walking down. And I'm told the Medal of Honor recipient, James E. Livingston, will also deliver the Pledge of Allegiance here shortly. But that's what's happening right now. So that's what's happening here, but we'll continue to bring you coverage throughout the day. JR, I'm going to toss it back to you. All right, Becky, thank you so very much. Yeah, that processional is going to continue for a few more moments here. I want to bring in the House Minority Leader again. I want to talk about something here. Uh, Mia McLeod wanted this job. She wanted to be governor of the state of South Carolina, Democrat from here in Richland County, announcing just yesterday that she's leaving the Democrat Party, saying that the Democrat Party does not have the same values that she has now, and she's moving forward. Disappointing news for the Democrats? What's your reaction? Not at all, and I think most people see that she simply lost an election. It's very clear that the voters in the Democratic Party did not believe that she was the best candidate. She lost her Senate district and almost lost her home precinct, but for about seven votes. So maybe she's out of touch and she should, she should leave. She should resign now and run again as an independent and see whether her voters agree with her. But not to make broad statements about what people believe when she can't, she doesn't know that. Did you have any idea that this was coming? That one one of the people who wanted to be governor, one of the key Democrats in the state, was going to lead the party. Well, I think it's an overstatement to call her a key Democrat in the state. She's an elected senator. She's had that position for a while, and she lost. And she almost lost, like I said, she almost lost her home precinct, and she did lose her entire Senate district. So I think that she could read the tea leaves, and I doubt that she was going to run again anyway. If she does, she'll certainly lose. Dave. Republicans, what's their take on what happened yesterday? I think you look at a situation like this, Jr., and it is very rare, if in ever in, in recent South Carolina history, that a non-party independent has taken a seat. I don't see how in the world Mia McLeod, who can't even win her own home precinct, can turn around and and continue to remain in the South Carolina Senate. I mean. I'm going to be real honest, folks, at home, you know, our South Carolina senators carry with them a lot of weight and a lot of power and a lot of responsibility. And I, I find it very kind of disingenuous to turn around and say that we can't turn around and find a way to Judge work Stephen together P. in the system P. that we have right now to get things accomplished. I mean, that's a big, big statement. Big statement and, and actually incorrect. And as you stated, our senators do have a lot of power. She's been in that district for a while. So whatever it is that she's complaining about, she should have fixed. And anytime you see a conservative and a liberal <laughs> agreeing on something, you've got to wonder what's going on in South Carolina besides Inauguration Day. All right, we're going to go back inside the studio now. Andrea Darcy standing by with more of our team coverage. All Ladies. right, JR, thank you so much. All right, we are watching this processional. We are now seeing the judges come down. We just saw Judge Bruce Williams from the Court of Appeal just make his way down. He not only works on the Court of Appeals, but in his spare time runs the drug court to uh, for many years, almost a decade to help people in South Carolina who are convicted of small drug claims get their lives back. Just saw him go down the stairs and now these are other judges coming as well. We know in this processional of dignitaries that we should expect to see former governors of South Carolina, inaugural chairs, university and college presidents will also be there along with state officers, lieutenant governor and the governor who will be sworn in by noon today. So uh, the day started very early this morning for the governor and those looking to celebrate his win in South Carolina with a prayer service at the First Presbyterian Church on Marion Street in downtown Columbia. This started at nine o'clock this morning, the swearing in ceremony beginning at 11 and then at two o'clock, the McMaster family will host an open house at the governor's mansion. That's on Richland Street in Columbia. The evening will wrap up with an inaugural ball at the Columbia Metropolitan Convention Center. 
Obviously, that is a ticketed event and an invitation only event. So if you weren't invited, unfortunately, that's not one of the parties you'll be able to attend tonight. Yes, want to interrupt you really quickly because we see just there at the bottom of your screen, Justice K. Hearn coming down the stairs. She is with the South Carolina Supreme Court. And of course, her uh, latest ruling causing a big, um, big changes in our state as they just ruled. The South Carolina Supreme Court just ruled last week that the state's fetal heartbeat law was in fact unconstitutional. Now that law in our state stands at 20 weeks where you can get an abortion uh, previously ahead of that ruling. Uh, the fetal heartbeat law was banning uh, abortions at six weeks. So again, that just coming down. Is that Senator Graham? I can't see. I believe that is Senator Lindsey Graham who is now making his way through the processional. Uh, let's listen in for a moment and see if we can hear as the announcer uh, talks more about the dignitaries. Joining us today for the 98th South Carolina inaugural, is a distinguished group of guests and dignitaries. They include Mrs. James Burroughs Edwards, former First Lady of South Carolina, who has been preceded. Please welcome Mrs. Edwards. Talking, all right, talking about Senator Graham there as we see him on our other camera uh, taking his seat. I believe this is our photographer, our own photographer following him, right, Darcy? Uh, there we go. Uh, taking his seat, I little history lesson today. I was talking with Brady about the inauguration today, and he was saying who is going to be there and such, and we were going down all the list. Of course, Senator Graham is a federal. He is a U.S. senator, but came in town today. We haven't seen Senator Tim Scott yet make an appearance. Not sure if he's busy in Washington or if he will be there at the inauguration today, but I was explaining, and I hope everybody knows this, but a little lesson. If you are U.S., it means you serve uh, in um, Washington DC and elected here in South Carolina but then of course our own members who we saw come down first 170 of them up oh, there we see our mayor at the top of the stairs uh, 170 members here in South Carolina elected to our South Carolina House of Representatives there we go Daniel Rickman South Carolina's newest mayor of the city of Columbia walking down the stairs. Um, I don't see his wife with him. His wife is a doctor here in South Carolina. She is a pediatrician and uh, he just recently took over for longtime mayor Steve Benjamin. You've heard several times this inauguration for Governor McMaster being described as historic. So if he completes all four years. He would be the longest serving governor in state history at 10 years. Now the state constitution limits governors to two elected four year terms, but because he completed former governor Nikki Haley's unexpired term first, he now has the ability to go beyond that eight year limit. Um, yeah, which makes him, like you heard everybody say, he is going to be our longest serving South Carolina governor. And it's, you know, it is a, a fitting uh, title for him. Obviously, this man was born in Columbia. He is 75 years old. He has been involved in politics his entire life, going all the way back to uh, 1981, being appointed by then President Reagan as our U.S. attorney. Now, if you don't know, again, another little lesson for you, if you don't know what our U.S. attorney is, a U.S. attorney is appointed to the state. They represent the entire state when it comes to federal cases. So that means that once that person is nominated, they would try any federal trials here in our state. Now that means death penalty cases in many uh, chances, especially here in South Carolina that is a death penalty state. So um, all of the cases that would have gone for the death penalty or had the death penalty as an option, those would have been under our uh, U.S. attorney and that was now Governor Henry McMaster in 1981 and then in 2002 he was elected attorney general and Dars I will never forget um, us having him on Friends at Five on our old set back Darcy does not remember <laughs> I've interviewed the governor a lot of times. Right? I don't know if this one time stands out to me. Okay, Go on. on he was, came on a Friends at Five on our old set to help celebrate the kickoff of the show with us when he was our state attorney general. And famously, Darcy and I were having an argument at the time. And as you know, the state attorney general is the top attorney in the state, the top elected attorney in the state. So once he won that and he was in um, our uh, studios, Darcy and I decided to have him measure us to decide which one of us was taller. I do remember that now. She won. Uh, I don't know if that was the best use of his, of his time. <laughs> 
or talents, but yes, it happened. At, well, as the top attorney in the state, we felt like he was the only person who could come in and weigh in on that. So um, that was back when he was uh, elected attorney general. And then, of course, the big change for him coming in 2014 when then President Trump uh, and by the way, do you remember that Governor McMaster was also the first uh, ho holding uh, somebody who was holding an office to endorse President Trump first here in South governor, Carolina? The in first. The um, so um, that was way. No, that was he was not a governor at the time. He was the Attorney General at the time when he um, endorsed. Yes, Trump? endorsed Trump. Well, so the other statewide officers who are going to be sworn in today as we continue to watch this inauguration day and uh, the processional dignitaries come through uh, are newly elected state superintendent of education, uh, Ellen Weaver, who won her office in November. Weaver replaces Molly Spearman, who decided to not run for re-election after serving eight years in office. And I got a chance to interview um, Ellen Weaver and all the candidates for superintendent, and she understands that she had a bit of a controversial run. Um, of course, she was the person that didn't hold the master's degree that was required by our state when she won the primary. Um, so she said she's hoping to move past all of that and really focus on education in our state. She was the founder of the CEO Palmetto Promise Institute. Um, um, and has served on the ex Education Oversight Committee. So she is um, hoping to really bring our schools together as far as funding goes and get more funding, she said, for uh, Wi-Fi as well um, to try and make sure that all of our schools have good Wi-Fi and that, that the kids get set home with homework, that they can do their homework successfully as well at home. I think it became very obvious during the pandemic how there was a huge digital divide yes. and the lack of resources and some of our most rural communities and so the true. need for children to be able to across the state have the same equal access to education so it will be interesting to see the policies and procedures that she puts in place to not only support educators but also to make sure that children are treated fairly regardless of zip code when it comes to their education and molly spearman has done an amazing job in the position i want to say that too um but now yeah ellen weaver will be sworn in today along with the governor we want to check in though with our friend J.R. Berry, who is live right now outside. And I want to say to J.R., um, because I love them, the 282nd Army Band, they're known all over the country. They are fantastic. <laughs> they are playing loudly in the background, but we can hear you, J.R., but go ahead and take over. Yeah, they're uh, playing the music as that processional continues here. We're waiting for the former governors to come down the steps now, and all the former living governors are with us today. Governor Riley, Governor Beasley, Governor Hodges, Governor Sanford, and Governor Nikki Haley. Of course, Dick Riley, a very popular governor back in the 70s and 80s here in South Carolina. One of the big popular Democrat governors here at the state has seen next to Jim Hodges as well. Absolutely. And, you know, Jim Hodges and I got elected together back in 1998. And I remember that day because it was probably five below zero. <laughs> uh, but again, exciting times back then, exciting times now. And to see all of the former governors back here, I think, pays reverence to the moment. Former governors are making their appearance now. Let's take a listen. Riley, former Secretary of the United States Department of Education. Please stand and be recognized. The Honorable David Boldrow Beasley, Executive Director of the United Nations World Food Program. The Honorable James Hovis Hodges. The 
Honorable Marshall Clement Sanford Jr. and former First Lady Jenny Sanford McKay. Some of those faces need no introduction to you, our viewer. Uh, we'll start at the top of the list. Governor, we uh, we saw Governor Dick Riley walk down the stairs. I believe Governor Riley was already seated. They asked the audience to stand in recognition of Governor Riley being there. Uh, Governor David Beasley, part of that processional coming down, the former UN World Food Program Director and Nobel Peace Prize. Amazing. Honoree. And you said he just retired from that position. He did retire from that position. Um, we saw Governor Jim Hodges and then uh, Governor Mark Sanford with former First Lady Jenny Sanford. And I have to see, say, uh, Darcy and I were both excited to see Jenny Sanford back downtown. We haven't seen her. She has gone to the Low Country, lives in Sullivan's Island, and has sort of stayed away from politics since uh, she was finished her time as First Lady. And I haven't seen those two appear together at an event in a very long time. This is one of those events, an inauguration that brings people together. It is the peaceful transfer of power on the state level. And so uh, following Governor Sanford, there was Governor Haley and uh, first gentleman, Michael Haley. Yep, they also still live here in South Carolina. Once again, um, living in the low country at the beach. They live in Kiowa now. Major Michael Haley still serving um, here in the South Carolina military. He is still part of the South Carolina Guard and still serving as a member of our military. So um, again, and those names need no introduction. And now Darcy seeing some scholars We're walk seeing in. The, the processional continue with college and university president the first president that I noticed was the Clemson University president. So I'm not sure if they're going in alphabetical order or not, how that was determined. <laughs> you got to go first. But uh, these are the head educators across the state on the collegiate level uh, being recognized today. And really quickly, oh, oh, we just switched cameras, but we had a, a shot there of some of the young kids sitting on stage, so I wanted to let you Dr. know. Hope Rivers. Oh, there you go. There you go. Um, okay, here we go. Here's the young people sitting on stage. Okay, and again, you're hearing the Army Band, the 282nd Army Band, but the young people sitting on stage are part of the South Carolina Governor's School for Humanities and Arts Choir, the Hammond Select ensemble and then the Irmo High School Concert Choir and all of them look so lovely. Congratulations to them for being invited out today to sing and play for our inauguration. This is a live event with team coverage. We're going to turn things back over to J.R. Berry who is there for us live. All right Andrea Darcy thank you so much. So we're Close to the lieutenant governor and governor coming in. Yes. What are you hoping to hear from the governor and his remarks in about the next 30 minutes? Or I think so? the governor is going to really lay out where he sees South Carolina needing to go over the next four years, JR. I think it's a really big statement for Henry McMaster to say, this is the legacy that I'm going to be leaving behind in the state of South Carolina. You take a look at the economic growth that's happened since he's been in office. You take a look at the things that have been going on when it comes to. Uh, Funding for education is a big issue that has been going on. I think you're going to hear those same themes uh, that he laid out Friday when he did his executive budget and said, listen, education is going to be important. Economic development is going to be important. Planning for the future is going to be important. And I think that's where Henry McMaster is going to go today. Right. I think he's going to talk about the plan for commerce and giving that money up front. I also want to hear what he says about I-73. 
I-73 is a highway we, we've been working on in Myrtle Beach for 20, 30 years, and he now put the money in his budget up front. So I want to hear what he does to try and move that ball forward because it hadn't moved as of yet. As House Minority Leader, how will Democrats work with Governor McMaster over the next four years? Listen, we are we stand hand in hand ready to move South Carolina forward, making sure that economic development and education are put on the forefront. Those issues that are not sensitive to women, those issues that are sensitive to abortion, we're not going to be lockstep on those. But with everything else, if we can help, we will. And I know this governor, if he wants to sit down with us, he will, and he'll say that, and we'll do it. You have a unique perspective, being that you've started serving under Governor Jim Hodges. So you served under Hodges. You served under Sanford. You served under Nikki Haley. So, Every and, governor and, and, and Governor, governor McMaster yes. right now. So which governor do you think you have worked well with over the years? I was new when Governor Hodges got in, so probably Governor Hodges. But this governor has been unique in his approach, and he is not fighting the General Assembly. He doesn't come out and bash us every day like some of the other ones did, uh, in particular Governor Haley and Governor Sanford, who made sure to denigrate us. He is not that kind of governor. He talks to us. He talks about his budget, and he wants to see how we can accomplish things together rather than at odds. Dave, your, your take on what he just said as far as working with governors. I think the most important thing that for folks at home is you're looking at how South Carolina government runs and operates. It really boils down to how well do the, do the three branches of government interact. And the, the interaction that goes on between our governor and the legislature is can be very tenuous at times and has been very tenuous at times. But I think what you see with Henry McMaster is you have relationships that have been built over decades. And that is not something that he takes for granted. I think it's a very important part of when he looks at how do I turn around and move things forward. You don't have uh, uh, the level of respect that you see today in, in the conversation that we're having here if you don't have a governor who says, I'm going to work on developing relationship and be a part of being in a, in a positive move forward, not an adversarial one. Viewers at home are seeing Molly Spearman walk down the stairs right now. That is the outgoing state education superintendent. And there is the incoming superintendent-elect, Ellen Weaver. And once the state constitutional officers take part in this processional, it will be the lieutenant governor and then the governor and then the program itself will actually start. Right. And I think with, I think what you're looking at now is it, this is what we call the peaceful transfer of power. And even though a lot of it is going to be carrying over from one person to another, uh, you know, you've got one major position that's been changed, and that's when Molly Spearman decided she was not going to run for re-election. Uh, Ellen Weaver has won that race. Again, I think is that was probably one of the most consequential elections that we and have controversial had. Controversial as well. Right. I mean, it was yeah, it's very controversial because there were arguments about whether she was qualified or not to even hold that spot. Democrats argued that she wasn't. She was elected anyway, and so we'll see what she does with education moving forward. Teachers are a very vocal group, and public education is important, and so we'll see what happens moving forward. And that's really a major part of our state budget, Jr. When you think about the amount of money, half the money that, that we bring in as a state and spend as a state goes into education, and that's going to be an important thing. All right. Here comes the lieutenant governor and her husband. Let's take a live look. the family of the governor, Henry Dargan McMaster Jr. and his wife, Virginia. And Mary Rogers McMaster Herskovitz and her husband, Samuel Herskovitz.
All right, we see the First Lady, Governor, Governor Henry McMaster, both standing at the top of the stairs. We see Peggy McMaster Please getting ready. Please welcome the First Lady of the State of South Carolina, Peggy McAbee McMaster. Coming down the stairs, we know she is very proud of her two children who came down um, right before her. The McMasters have talked about becoming grandparents for the first time. They are now the proud grandparents of two different babies. They spend lots of their time on the weekend, they say, playing uh, with those children. And that wedding, the wedding of their daughter, was actually held at the governor's mansion. Mary got married at the governor's mansion not too long ago. Well, what should not be wasted on this moment is as the governor begins his historical term, again, if at the completion of four years he completes his term, he will be the longest serving governor in South Carolina, which in turn would make Peggy McMaster the longest, the longest serving, serving first, lady. first lady. You're right, Darcy. That is a fun fact I didn't think of. And now we see Lieutenant Governor Pamela Avet. Ladies and gentlemen, the Lieutenant Governor of the state of South Carolina, the Honorable Pamela Sue Evett. You know, I remember when Governor McMaster announced his running mate. She was a political newcomer. She was not somebody's name that we had heard for years. She is from the upstate and was a businesswoman prior to being named um, Lieutenant Governor with Governor McMaster and being named his running mate. And she said she hoped to bring a focus on business and bringing new businesses into South Carolina during her time as Lieutenant Governor. She said that would be her focus. There was a point in time when the lieutenant governor and the governor did not run yes. on the same ticket. Uh, so for history buffs in South Carolina, you may remember that. And, and actually, Nikki Haley and Henry McMaster did not run on the same ticket. They, they ran not. against each other. All right, we see the Citadel Band there, the special band getting ready for Governor McMaster as he makes his way to uh, the top of the stage. He has requested this and some Scottish bagpipes and music. Again, these musicians coming to us from the Citadel. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise and greet the governor of the great state of South Carolina, His Excellency, Henry Dargan McMaster. All right, the processional now coming to an end. The next thing on the list, that again, these are cadets from the Citadel playing this music. Um, and the welcome will be done by the Honorable Thomas Alexander as the ceremony moves Please along. Please be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, the presiding officer for this inaugural ceremony, the President of the Senate, the Honorable Thomas C. Alexander. Good morning. From where I live in the foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountains down to the Grand Strand, from the Sea Islands up to the beautiful waters of Lake Wiley. In every county and city throughout our Palmetto State, today is a day of celebration. Welcome to the inauguration of the 117th Governor of South Carolina and the inauguration of our Lieutenant Governor and other constitutional officers. As St. Paul encouraged the early church in Rome, may we, the sons and daughters of South Carolina always work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. Today, 
We celebrate the collective voice of our citizens. The vote is a cherished action that shows the power of the people and from which the authority of governance flows. Today, you will hear Governor McMaster, Lieutenant Governor Evett, and the other duly elected constitutional officers voice a solemn oath to fulfill the duties of the offices to which they have been elected. On this stage today are the leaders of the legislative, executive, and judicial branches of your state's government. Those assembled here today represent the many public servants who strive to provide for future generations. The awesome responsibility of those here today is to ensure that opportunity is spread to every South Carolinian. Our port is now the deepest on the East Coast, opening a pathway to the economic engine of America. Our technical college system is as strong as it has ever been and still a model for the world. Both private companies and public agencies are investing in sustainability initiatives that protect our natural resources for the generations of today and tomorrow. South Carolina is leading a manufacturing renaissance. We make fighter jets and commercial airplanes, automobiles, tires, brakes, batteries, and many other components that power more and more of America's economy. These cornerstones of our economy foster opportunity for her citizens, their chance to participate in a fast-paced, technology-driven world that must be continually cultivated. Today, history is being made. The Honorable Henry McMaster has the opportunity to become South Carolina's longest serving governor. <laughs> governor, you are a source of stability and sound judgment in a rapidly changing world. I sincerely appreciate the fact that your door is always open. Your leadership style of collaboration is a keystone of today's success and tomorrow's promise. I'd also like to recognize my dear friend, the Speaker of the House, the Honorable Merle Smith. Mr. Speaker, as you preside this session, I know that you would lead the House of Representatives in the honorable and collaborative manner, applying common sense solutions to the challenges we face as a state. Together, we can accomplish great things. To paraphrase President Reagan, all we need is our best effort and our willingness to believe in ourselves and to believe in our collective capacity to perform great deeds, to believe that together, with God's help, we can solve the problems which now confront us. As we leave this place today, and journey into the dawn of a new legislative session. Let us work together as South Carolinians to address the problems of today and prepare for the opportunities of a boundless future. May God continue to bless the great state of South Carolina and the United States of America. Thank you. And now we ask that you stand as Rabbi Jonathan Case of Beth Shalom Synagogue in Columbia delivers the invocation. As Americans, we honor those who came from the far reaches of the world to craft a democracy of liberty and justice under the aegis of God who believes in us. We owe a debt of gratitude to those who have labored tirelessly and nobly to ensure that the quality of life, dignity, and freedom be given to all its citizens, no matter their faith, 
status, creed, or origin. We extend our humble prayers for courage, safety, and perseverance to our committed leaders who continue in this tradition of continuing to build on the legacy of those who founded this great nation on this great day. May the Holy One bless them and their loved ones with vision enough to sustain them through days of light, but especially in days when darkness looms. Gracious God, make us an instrument of your grace. Weave us into a blessed community that reflects your power, love, and forgiveness. Bless us and our differences. Grant us the courage and conviction to stand together as each of us are crafted in your image, the one God, each uniquely gifted to bring to the world that, that which with we have been endowed. And as we gather as one extended family, lead us, God, to better ourselves and our world on each step of the journey of our lives. As Abraham Joshua Heschel wrote, prayer may not save us, but prayer may make us worthy of being saved. So let us follow humbly that advice. We pray not for ourselves today, but more altruistically for those that represent the best of what we hope, work for, and to create. We pray for our elected officials, health, courage, and determination to create the vision of what God knows what we be can become on earth. And I ask you therefore to join me in sacred prayer for the welfare of this country, this state, and this significant moment as we celebrate a great milestone, the 98th gubernatorial inauguration in South Carolina's history. It is our privilege to witness Governor McMaster as he takes his rightful place for a second term of office among those who have steered South Carolina since 1778. As we gather to celebrate and sanctify this moment in the inauguration of our governor, we begin with a moment of prayer on behalf of Henry McMaster and his family, Lieutenant Governor Pamela Vett, our constitutional officers, and all who hold office in this great land. We ask that the Holy One, blessed be, Bless them with wisdom and strength of character, enabling the state of South Carolina to be an ongoing shining beacon for good in the world and a source of pride for its citizens. Bless Governor McMaster with health, wisdom, and understanding, and a lot of patience. His task is not simple, but harshly demanding. Be with him in deliberation and grant him the necessary light to be a force for concern and love for all of our citizens of this great state. As one people, as one family, brothers and sisters, we pray that you, Lord God, hear us all and listen to this holy prayer and respond along with all of your children. Amen. We may be seated. We ask that you remain standing for the presentation of the colors by members of the Color Guard from the Citadel, the Military College of South Carolina. Here to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance is an American hero of rare distinction, a Medal of Honor recipient for, quote, conspicuous gallantry at the risk of his life above and beyond the call of duty, retired United States Marine Corps Major General James E. Livingston of Mount Pleasant. I would begin by saying it is a great day to be in South Carolina. And you are witnessing freedom on display today. Would you join me in the Pledge of Allegiance 
to the greatest nation in the world. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please join Converse University's own, whom you may recognize from the hit TV show, The Voice, Emma Brooke Alley, as we sing the national anthem. Veterans and service members not in uniform may choose to render a hand salute to honor the flag. We ask that everyone else place their hands over their hearts. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rockets were clear the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there oh say does that star spangled banner wave or the Please be seated. The Hammond School Select Ensemble from Columbia, directed by Stephen Hillard and accompanied by Lucinda Shields, will now perform two selections with soloists Drew Springs and Casey Tompkins, Schultz Alosha and City Called Heaven. Oh, 
Please welcome to the podium House Speaker, the Honorable G. Merle Smith, Jr. Good afternoon. What a great day it is to be joining you. It is 2023 and South Carolina is booming. The past few months and years have been record breaking for our state. We are seeing growth like we've never seen before, as well as economic success after success. That is in no small part and thanks to many, pe many of the people that I'm standing with here today. Our state leadership has a vision for what is possible and a determination to get there. Most importantly, they keep South Carolina's best interests at heart always. I'm excited for the start of a very productive season that I will know will include much collaboration. I know that our leadership from our Governor McMaster, our Lieutenant Governor Pamela Evett, our Constitution officers, our members of the Senate and our members of the House of Representatives and communities all across our state, we will be able to achieve great things in this year. I am certain that South Carolina's best days are right ahead of her and may God continue to bless this great state and the United States of America. Ladies and gentlemen, the oath of office will now be administered to the Lieutenant Governor by the Honorable G. Merle Smith, Jr. your right hand and repeat after me I do solemnly swear I do solemnly swear that I am duly qualified that I am duly qualified according to the Constitution of this state according to the Constitution of this state to exercise the duties to exercise the duties of the office to which I have been elected to the office of which I've been elected and that I will to the best of my ability and I will to the best of my ability discharge the duties thereof discharge the duties thereof and preserve protect and defend and preserve protect and defend the constitution of this state the constitution of this state and of the united states and of the united states so help me god so help me god congratulations Thank you. Officers, will you please come forward as I call your name? Secretary of State, the Honorable Mark Hammond. State Treasurer, the Honorable Curtis M. Loftus, Jr. Attorney General, the Honorable Alan M. Wilson. Comptroller General, the Honorable Richard Ekstrom. Superintendent of Education, the Honorable Ellen E. Weaver. The Commissioner of Agriculture, the Honorable Hugh E. Weathers. Please raise your right hand and repeat after me. I do solemnly swear. I do solemnly swear. And that I am duly qualified. That I am duly qualified. 
according to the Constitution of this state, according to the Constitution of this state, to exercise the duties, to exercise the duties of the office to which I have been elected, of the office to which I have been elected, and that I, and that I will, to the best of my ability, and that I will, to the best of my ability, discharge the duties thereof, discharge the duties thereof, and preserve, protect, and defend preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of this state, the Constitution of this state, and of the United States, and of the United States. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations, friends. Ladies and gentlemen, the University of South Carolina a cappella singing group will now perform a classic. Hallelujah. secret chord that David played and it pleased the Lord but you don't really care for music do ya well it goes like this the fourth the fifth the minor fall and the major lift the baffled king composing hallelujah Ha! 
Now we will hear Stars I Shall Find from the talented Irmo High Concert Choir under the direction of choral director Frank Turner and accompanied by Allison Hilbish. Ladies and gentlemen, the oath of office will be administered to Governor Henry Dargan McMaster by the Honorable John W. Kittredge of the Supreme Court of South Carolina. your left hand on the Bible, raise your right hand, and repeat after me, sir. I do solemnly swear. I do solemnly swear. That I am duly qualified. That I am duly qualified. According to the Constitution of this state. According to the Constitution of this state. To exercise the duties of the office. To exercise the duties of the office. Of Governor of South Carolina. Of Governor of South Carolina. To which I have been elected. To which I have been elected. 
and that I will, to the best of my ability, and that I will, to the best of my ability, discharge the duties thereof. Discharge the duties thereof. And I'll preserve, protect, and defend. I will preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of this state. Constitution of this state. And of the United States. And of the United States. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. The South Carolina Air National Guard salutes Governor Henry Dargan McMaster with a flight of two F-16 Fighting Falcons from the 169th Fighter Wing, McIntyre Joint National Guard Base. Be seated, please. That's the sound of freedom. Ladies and gentlemen, the governor of the great state of South Carolina his Excellency, Henry Dargan McMaster. Thank you. What a wonderful day. I'm almost inclined to yield my time to those young people singing. I don't know if I've ever heard more beautiful music. As they were singing, I was reminded of a song from long ago. It was first pop, this was in the 60s, popularized by Nat King Cole and later by Bobby Darin. The name of the song was Nature Boy. And it had a line that said, the greatest thing you will ever learn is to give love and receive love in return. And that's what I was thinking, listening to those people, those youngsters, have their, their whole lives ahead of them. And it's our job to see that they and others reach their full potential in happiness in our great state. I'm happy to welcome you. <laughs> to this magnificent state house, this historic state house on another beautiful South Carolina day. Your presence expresses your confidence in our bright future. The people of our great state have given me the honor and privilege of serving as your governor for another four years. My family and I thank you deeply. If we were at the famous Darlington Raceway today, these early days of 23 would be the moment we hold our breath just before the green flag is dropped. Much history has been made here, and we're about to make some more. I have in my office a framed drawing of the city of Charleston from the view of Sullivan's Island, dated 1739, accompanied by a report inscribed upon it and addressed to as follows, quote, His Excellency James Glenn Esquire, Captain General, Governor, and Commander-in-Chief, in and over His Majesty's Province of South Carolina, and Vice Admiral of the same. And it goes on, humbly inscribed by his much obliged humble servant, B. Roberts. It was, according to the inscription, published according to Act of Parliament by B. Roberts and W. H. Toms, June 9, 1739. It reads in part, Charlestown, the metropolis of the province of South Carolina, is presently pleasantly situated between Cooper and Ashley Rivers. The climate of Carolina is extremely agreeable and wholesome and may well be looked upon as the most temperate part of the habitable earth. It is the fairest and most fruitful province belonging to Great Britain. Its silk is preferable to any, and its rice is the best in the world. So that it is no wonder of Charlestown be now a very great and flourishing town, adorned with handsome and commodious buildings, among which the Church of St. Philip may justly be reckoned the finest structure in America. This town and province may justly be esteemed the most flourishing of any of His Majesty's dominions end of America, in America." End of quote. I believe that Mr. B. Roberts' estimation of the remarkable nature of South Carolina was completely accurate. 
We know that it was shared by the French and the Spanish explorers and their sovereigns before him, and by the Native Americans before them. And I believe it is still true today, with the notable exception that South Carolina no longer belongs to King George, but to us. <laughs> Unmentioned but implicit in the success observed by Mr. B. Roberts is the character, nature, and circumstances of the inhabitants of the province of South Carolina, that is, the people. According to historian Walter Edgar, our early inhabitants had arrived at different times under a variety of conditions from eight European countries as many as 25 West African cultures, today comprising four countries, and over 25 Native American nations, those bearing such familiar names as Congaree, Kumbi, Kiowa, Catawba, Walkamaw, PD, and Edisto. Through those years and centuries long ago and up to our living memories, our people have seen it all. Hurricanes, fires, floods, tornadoes, earthquakes, piracy, Indian wars, indentured servitude, slavery, a revolutionary war, a civil war, world wars, and others. No state has a more fascinating, momentous history than our own. And through it all, and perhaps because of it, we have grown, endured, and prospered. The greatest asset we have is each other, the people the great unique people of South Carolina. Today, when business leaders from around the world measure the assets of our state, they remark on our people, the character and nature of the people themselves. Visitors do the same. They sense their loyalty, patriotism, kindness, and steadfastness. They see the natural paradise in which we work and live. They see the historic confluence of our Judeo-Christian and military traditions, and they like what they see, sometimes more clearly than we do ourselves. For these reasons and more, our economy is flourishing and opportunities abound. I view our foundations for great prosperity and happiness as resting on three pillars, economic strength, education, and our natural environment. But we know that, with, that a goal without a plan is only a dream. Today our economy is as strong as it's ever been in modern times. South Carolina's booming economy has once again created a record surplus. So it should come as no surprise that in 2020, 2022 was the most successful year for economic development in our state's history. In fact, we broke the record for the largest economic development project announcement, not once, but twice in the same year. State government is in superior fiscal shape. We have the largest rainy day reserve and fund balance and lowest amount of debt than any other time in recent memory. Until recently, South Carolina had the highest personal income tax rate in the Southeast and the 12th highest in the nation, but no more. Last year, I was honored to sign into law the largest income tax cut in South Carolina history. And many thanks to the General Assembly for that fine work. We have made and will continue to make transformative investments in our state's infrastructure, from widening interstates, repairing and replacing roads, bridges, and highways, to over a billion and a half dollars for new water, sewer, and storm water, in our beautiful rural communities. We are setting our state on an accelerated path to complete, compete globally for new jobs and investment. We dredged our Charleston Harbor 52 feet, the deepest on the Atlantic coast and able to handle the biggest ships in the world any day, any time, on any tide. We relied on common sense and the Constitution during the pandemic. And while other states faltered, Ours flew, with some of our businesses having their best years ever. <laughs> A 
One moment. Oh. <laughs> As once all roads led to Rome, today all quests for prosperity lead to education. Education has been described as a foot race in which the baton of knowledge is passed from one generation to the next. The historian Barbara Tuckman wrote, books are the carriers of civilization. Without books, history is silent, literature dumb, science crippled, thought and speculation at a standstill. Without books, the development of civilization would have been impossible. We must do whatever it takes to see that every child, to see that every child in our state has the opportunity to receive an excellent education. Albert Einstein said, quote, a problem can never be solved by thinking on the same level that produced it. He was right. We must think big and bold, and we will. Standing here four years ago, I said, being perceived as weak in education is not good but being perceived as not committed to fixing it is disastrous. Six years ago, the minimum starting salary for a teacher in South Carolina was $30,113. Today, it is 40,000. My goal is by 2026 is that we have a minimum starting salary of at least, at least $50,000. Until last year, South Carolina's system for funding K-12 education was archaic and confusing. A piecemeal system consisting of 29 separate line item appropriations. Now, a consolidated formula makes sure that the funding follows the child and provides transparency for parents. To increase the percentage of children who enter our public schools ready to learn, we extended full-day, four-year kindergarten to all at-risk children in the state. Today, we are serving 16,103 children in this program, which is an all-time high. And ladies and gentlemen, we have placed an armed certified school resource officer known as SROs in 90% of our state's public schools, 90%. And we will not stop until there is an officer in every school, in every county, all day, every day. We know that access to an affordable de degree or skilled trade certificate is essential to ensure that our state has the trained and educated workforce to compete for jobs and investment in the future. To that end, we have frozen college tuition for four straight years and provided a record amount of financial aid and scholarships to students in need. To address the historic labor shortage, our workforce scholarships have allowed over 10,000 South Carolinians to earn an industry credential in high demand careers like manufacturing, healthcare, computer science, information technology, transportation, logistics, and constructions. And remember, go ahead. <laughs> We're on a roll, y'all. <laughs> Remember, businesses in the United States and abroad have clearly demonstrated their desire to bring their fortunes and facilities to South Carolina to employ our people. They are, to coin a phrase, they're putting their money where our people are. What we must do now is double down. We must continue investing in our people to ensure that they are prepared to reap the benefits of our future prosperity. This brings us to the third pillar of our prosperity, our natural and cultural heritage. Few states, if any, can match the natural beauty, bounty, and variety of South Carolina, from the mountains to the sea. And few can match the elegance and craftsmanship 
of our historic homes, churches, and synagogues and other structures found in our land, including in Beaufort, Charleston, Georgetown, and Camden, built during the times when Mother Nature herself was the sole source and fount of our prosperity. I truly believe, I truly believe if we can't find peace, happiness, and comfort in the pine forests and tidal creeks of South Carolina, we'll just have to wait till we all get to heaven. <laughs> Numerous scholars recognize that the Revolutionary War was won here. With over 200 battlefields and skirmishes in Britain's unsuccessful Southern campaign, notably the battles of Kings Mountain and Cowpens, many historical sites still need markers today, including the camp of General Francis Marion and his patriots in the PD swamps. The British could not find it and we can't either. Our Gullah Geechee culture in the Low Country is surviving today as a link to the past. We must preserve it. Our magnificent live oaks have seen more history than any of us here. This natural and cultural heritage is an integral part of our quality of life. It's why we stay here, why others come, many as tourists and some as investors. And with them, ladies and gentlemen, comes money sometimes millions, even billions. And from that come jobs and careers, which in turn produce funds for school and educations, which in turn produce a deep appreciation of our natural and cultural heritage. And so the cycle goes round and round, up and up. We recently created a new cabinet agency called the Office on Resilience which adopted the findings of our Floodwater Commission. Its purposes include measuring our strengths and weaknesses concerning flooding, erosion, and the conditions of our rivers, coasts, and barrier islands, and, all, and to mitigate, accommodate, and respond to flooding, and also to coordinate efforts of economic and natural resilience with governmental and non-governmental agencies and entities. Vigorous economic growth and the preservation of our shared natural heritage and environment are not, are not opposing objectives which must be balanced as in a competition, one against the other. Instead, they are complementary, intertwined and inseparable, each dependent on the other. Each can be accomplished to the fullest if we plan now and be bold. The big question today is, will anyone recognize South Carolina, our South Carolina, in a hundred years? Will we allow our state's cultural and environmentally significant structures, monuments, lands, islands, and waterways to be lost forever to overdevelopment, mismanagement, or flooding, erosion, or from storm damage? Or will we preserve and protect our history and environment and the public's access to them? This is our moment to act while we still can. And of course, to preserve these great resources and realize our full economic and educational potentials, we have to do something. Our first duty, the first duty of government is to keep South Carolinians safe. To do that, we must maintain a robust law enforcement presence and fully fund the police. And also, when we do that, we need to close the revolving door for career criminals, keeping them behind bars and not out on bail while they do it again. <clears throat> this also includes stronger laws to keep illegal guns out of the hands of criminals and juveniles. We must also ensure that the public has confidence in whom and how we elect all of our judges, how we select our judges, by making the processes more transparent and accountable so that every South Carolinian, born and unborn, may enjoy life, liberty, and happiness.
Thank you. Thank you. In closing, to all my friends in the General Assembly, and that's all members of the General Assembly, the state of South Carolina is richly blessed with a hardworking and talented people. We know that. I have faith in our people, and I have, in faith, faith, I have faith in those whom we have elected to represent them in this state house. I say, let us continue our successful partnership one that has been based on communication, collaboration, and cooperation, and let us set our state on a course that will provide the opportunity for prosperity, success, and happiness for generations of South Carolinians to come. Ladies and gentlemen, the best is yet to come. May God continue to bless America and our great state of South Carolina. All right, there you go. Governor McMaster officially sworn Thank in you. for his second full term as governor of the great state of we South Carolina as 75 South years Carolina old. At the completion of this term, he will be the longest serving governor in the state of South Carolina. We are going to wrap up our on air coverage, but we're going to continue to follow the inauguration on our website at WLTX.com. You can also make sure to watch us on our YouTube tube channel and WLTX Plus. We're going to jump over to those channels now, so join us there. know Darcy and his um, proposal for what should be enacted in 2023. He was asking for more money for teachers. He wanted to give every teacher a raise so that it was now $42,500. We've heard of a lot from a lot of different um, singers today. We have absolutely loved all of the performances. We heard from Irmo High School. We also heard from Hammond High School here in the Midlands. The program is going to continue with the South Carolina Governor's School for the Arts and Humanities Choir performing The Rain is Over and Gone.
Rain is Over and Gone, presented by the South Carolina Governor's School for the Arts and Humanities Choir. You could just see the governor and first Ladies lady turning and around in their seats, and he was tapping his toes to try to listen to the school in his name. It's in Greenville, South Carolina. It's a residential school. They go through a big audition process, and now we're going to hear um, next the benediction from Norris B. Darden. Let us bow together. Our Father and our God, our help in ages past and our hope for years to come. Elohim, El Shaddai, Yahweh, El Elyon, the God that is more than enough. How awesome you are. We come today to say thank you. You did it again. Thank you for your loving kindness. Thank you for your care and concern. You are God and beside you there is none other. You did it again. Thank you that nothing happens without your permission. Thank you, our Father and our God, for Governor Henry McMaster, his wife, his children, his mind and demeanor, his cabinet and staff, his wisdom and knowledge, his love and care. Thank you for your selection one more time. You did it again. And now as we leave this place but never your presence, Fill us with joyful anticipation for what is yet to come. Your sovereign rule and judgment are without debate. Your majesty and power are without equal. Please continue to bless and keep our state and this man of God you sent to serve strong in the Lord and the power of his might for yet another term. You did it again. You called him, anointed and appointed him for such a time as this. Thank you, sir. Before we were born, you ordained him. Before we were born, you appointed and anointed him to be a voice to the nations. Empower and surround him with bright and brilliant, talented and keen problem-solving approaches to the challenges we face today. A term and a team that will turn this state upside down and right side up again. Call for such a time as this. A team with promises of hope and prosperity that we may know success in a most unusual way in the state, even in national affairs, and prosperity without bound. Pressing toward the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus our Lord, revealing your power to protect and defend and preserve. South Carolina's impact upon our nation will bear a divine mark ushering in better government, better social programs, better health care, and a better life for all. Lord, we thank you today. You did it again. You sought and found a man after your own heart. You promised that you would never leave us nor forsake us, that you would be with us to the end, and you always keep your promises. We believe you today that the best is yet to come. And now unto him who is able to keep us from falling, and present us faultless before the presence of exceeding glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Father, be glory, dominion, majesty, and power, his forth now and forevermore. And all the people of God said, Amen. Please remain standing and join in the singing of God Bless America as the inaugural recession is led by His Excellency, the Governor of South Carolina, the First Lady, and the McMaster family.
And that is the conclusion of the 98th inauguration of the governor of South Carolina. Uh, the inauguration started shortly after 11 o'clock this morning, beginning early this morning. The festivities with a church service at 9 o'clock. That was then a prayer service followed by the swearing in on the south side of the South Carolina State House. Yeah, very special ceremony. Loved hearing all the music. Love he's that's Irmo High School right there that uh, he's walking by the same singers from Irmo. We also heard from the beautiful singers from Hammond and uh, their band leader, Stephen Hillard. Uh, that band or that choir travels all around the country. Um, we had a flyover. Two F-16s flew in formation from the 169th. That is at McIntyre Joint Guard Base. We're now watching all the dignitaries that were gathered today and leave. And Darcy, it wasn't just Henry McMaster that got sworn in today. It was all of the state constitution officers, the state constitution, for those who, of you who are history buffs or just looking for a reminder in a civics lesson, sets that the governor's four-year term will start at noon on the Wednesday after the second Tuesday in January. And so that's why that 12 o'clock time was so important for his swearing in. And Darcy and I had a little laugh because actually he did not get sworn in by noon, Darce. I think it was about 12.15. It was about 12.15 by the time we got to it. A lot of things in the program um, to get to, but we did see Mark Hammond, Curtis Loftus, Alan Wilson, Richard Ekstrom, Ellen Weaver, and Hugh Weathers also being sworn in. We didn't get to talk about Hugh Weathers um, as he was coming down the stairs earlier, but he is our agriculture commissioner. He started, believe it or not, the South Carolina Carolina certified South Carolina grown program here in our state, something that will live on long after he decides to leave office. But you know, when you go to the grocery store, all the products, if you're ever wondering where the fruit comes from, or if it's something like a dressing or a seasoning, you can look for that South Carolina grown sticker. That is something that he started. Hugh Weather started himself so that we can not only give our South Carolina farmers and business people more business, but also, you know, it's local, you know, it hasn't traveled forever to come and find you at the grocery store. As the program comes to a close, we do want to remind you that we have team coverage. News 19's J.R. Berry is standing by now with Dave Wilson from Insiders to talk more about today and the importance to all South Carolinians. All right, ladies, thank you so very much. Yeah, the program wrapping up, as you can see, uh, as the attendees file out, Dave, about a 20 minute speech from the governor today. Yep. Took office at about 12 16 gave about a 20 minute address we heard some familiar things from the governor today about education and about law enforcement and about prosperity here in the state of south carolina but toward the end of his remarks today he addressed something that was in the news last week that is the three two court decision by the state supreme court let me let me to our viewers who may have missed it he said we must also ensure that the public has confidence in whom and how all of our judges are selected by making the processes more transparent and accountable so that every South Carolinian born and unborn may enjoy life, liberty, and happiness. And when he said that, members of the legislators stood up. It was the it was the only standing ovation for the governor in this entire address today. Not that it was a, anything other than the, a very strong statement from Henry McMaster when he talked about the education of our, of our people, about the economy about what needs to be done in the environment. But when he started talking about the issue of life in South Carolina, which has been a very controversial issue over the last few weeks, especially when that Supreme Court decision came down, a 3-2 decision that overturned a landmark piece of legislation that he signed two years ago, almost this week, because it was the moment in which he was saying, it is time for to do a for lack of a better phrase, a shot across the bow about mm. how we actually elect judges in South Carolina. Is that something that you think he's going to focus on over his next term of office, trying to change the makeup of the state Supreme Court? I think there will be a major change in the makeup of the Supreme Court, but more importantly, Jr. is going to be how we actually select and bring judges to the Supreme Court because that's a process that's, that's built into the Constitution of the state by a Judicial Merit Selection Committee. That's members of the House, members of the Senate, and, and folks who work within the legal system who have been making those those choices but I think he's gonna to want to see a lot more of his input going right. in that and that for future governors as well all right we want to go uh, continue our team coverage here this afternoon Becky Buds was here for all the festivities today she's joining us live now Becky 
JR. I want to touch on um, a few main points that Governor Henry McMaster also touched on in his speech. That includes economic development and education and preserving South Carolina's natural lands. I think something we've heard throughout today is South Carolina's booming economy. They've had the most successful economic year in 2022, and they also implemented the largest income tax cut in state history. And so when we talk about Governor Henry McMaster's goals for the next four years, a lot of them are doable because he has that majority Republican state house to back him on that. And so another thing he wants to get done is putting a school resource officer in every school right now. They're in about 90 percent of schools. And so he's really reflected on the last four years, um, but also pushed for the next four. And that would include um, money towards expediting bridge replacements and roads. And so it looks like he has a lot of things that he wants to get done. And I think he could do it. The legislator backs him on a lot of his goals um, from both parties. So it was interesting to hear his speech. And um, yeah, um, but I'll toss it back to you guys in the studio. Becky uh, Buds, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Becky. Yeah, it's been wonderful to watch all the students enjoy their time at the State House grounds. Darcy and I were just laughing because it's a mommy moment now that, you know, the moms are going, okay, kids, get on the stairs. We'll take a picture. <laughs> um, loved hearing from, like we said, all the local choirs today and seeing the flyover from the 169th. The governor talking about what he wants to get done in the future in our state. Um, and it is what he says is going to be a big year. Darcy, um, last year it was. South Carolina had the 12th highest income tax um, in the country, and he said he wanted to lower that this year in the agenda. $87 million for income tax breaks, um, trying to give more money to South Carolina uh, workers. He says that's a one of the huge things he'd like to accomplish in the coming years. The governor won his latest term in office with a 17 percentage point victory over Joe Cunningham in November's election. Uh, as we speak with lawmakers, they say that they are excited about the opportunity to continue to work with the governor again as he goes into his second term. But even as this inauguration is wrapping up, the day is not over for the governor of South Carolina, Henry McMaster. At two o'clock, the McMaster family will be hosting an open house at the governor's mansion. That's on Richland Street in Columbia from two to 3.30. It is open to the public if you find some time and would like to go over there and shake the hands of the first family. And then at 7.30 this evening, the inaugural ball will begin at the Columbia Metropolitan Convention Center. It is for ticket holders only. It is an invitation only event. And so even as we wrap up our coverage on air right now, we are not done with this historic no. day today. Absolutely not. News 19 has team coverage throughout the day. Thank you to JR and Becky and our team in the field over there at the State House and to everybody here working behind the scenes. We are going to continue to cover this historic day, the 98th swearing in of a governor of South Carolina, Governor Henry McMaster. That's it for now. We'll see you again Again on air at five. Watch it again right now on WLTX Plus, available on Roku and Fire TV.